podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to this next episode. We said at the end of the last one that we were going to do histrionic, but because it's our show and we can do what we want, we've decided to do part one and part two of working with the borderline client. I'm Jackie and um, I'm one of the co-hosts of this podcast, The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors, and this is the wonderful Bob Cook. So Bob, we're doing part one and two, another I wanted, to, I wanted to say another hefty one then, but maybe that's me filtering things. We did two weeks on working with a narcissistic client and we're going to do two weeks working on the borderline clients because they are quite complex. Yeah, they're complex. Um, and often, I was thinking about how I felt at the moment. It's very hot at the moment. Yes. Uh, I'm sitting in this uh, office and it's hot. And often, I think therapists, when they get embroiled in a, a process with a so-called in inverted commas borderline client they often feel very hot under the color color <laughs> and um this is what we can talk about so yeah classically these types of clients that we're going to talk about here is called the borderline client because uh best way to look at this is in terms of uh, the continuum for health where i said you put neurosis on one side the left side um of the quad of the quadrant and psychosis on the other end and uh, you know in terms of adult functioning um, the neurosis is they've got quite good adult functioning though they may have traits and then we go right to the other side where you've got psychosis where people are out of touch with reality and don't have much adult functioning now the middle ground is where the borderline sits which is why it's called borderline in other words um, they can operate fairly well sometimes in touch, terms of reality testing. And at other times they fall into maybe even fluid psychosis where they're out of touch with reality, which is why it's called, or this condition is called the borderline process. I see this client more in connection with early emotional confusion where they've had a lot of trauma in their history. Um, rather than see it in terms of a borderline condition but they do fluctuate between neurosis and psychosis quite quickly yeah so this is all linked into early early childhood stuff well as is most Confusion. of you yeah as a, as in a way as most of these dis disorders we're talking about uh, then they all have traits and more disordered people are the more trauma they will have had but I think the so-called borderline client um, is highly traumatized um, suffering from real emotional confusion um, from a child which then gets enacted out as they attempt to grow up yeah mm. yeah and and I wanted to say function normally in adult life, but I'm not sure what functioning normally actually means in adult life because we all have certain traits that yeah, show yeah. up at certain times. Yeah, but I think there is a way of looking at it. And, you know, therapists will say, well, what is normal? But if we use perhaps TA language to look at this a bit, the PAC model, then we could say another way of looking at this would be how much access a person has to their adult ego state and when I say adult ego state, I mean um, reality, basically, uh, you know, reality functioning and staying in the here and now. Now, the more disturbed a person is or the more um, problems they have, they're more likely to dip into the side of unreality, which yeah. we might call psychosis. So when I think you say normal life, I think of it more in terms of a person's ability to access their here and here and now functioning which in ta we call the adult ego state yeah which again going back to the really really early early podcasts that we did that was one of the 
the main criteria of, of you know taking on a client is that they have enough adult capacity to be in therapy that's right and difficult to judge so if somebody rings you up um or you might do an assessment even over the phone or even face to face it may this disturbance might not show up so easily in the first assessment that you might do and may be triggered more by the therapeutic content that you work with so even though you would do an assessment and if, if you're pretty experienced you can have a good hunch about how disturbed a person is um and you still might get it wrong yeah 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 when you say a hunch do you look for a feeling when you're with a, a client when you're doing the first assessment well we did that podcast on assessments and uh, I think, you know, I'm, I've been working for quite a long time now and you do get feelings with clients, but I think the feeling is really backed up by what I would call a professional hunch, which is probably backed up by facts. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody came in to see you, would you have a, an inkling quite early on that, you know, this person had borderline characteristics? Yeah, yes, I definitely would. And I think that's partly because of my level of experience. Yeah. Um, I think mostly by my level of experience um, and also perhaps by the training and the literature uh, that I will have read. So what would you be seeing with, with somebody that walked in the therapy room? With a borderline process? Mm, yeah. It's an interesting one because if you look at the literature, we'll say bipolar. Now, one of the characteristics of a bipolar traits or disorder is that they shift very quickly or can shift very quickly uh, and even in a session between two distinct parts of the self. Now, usually somebody who's got bipolar traits uh, will what is often called time travel, but traveling between two parts of the ego uh, will take perhaps a day or even a morning. But a more disturbed a person is, they might even do that in the session. So if that's happening, that might be mistaken for what is often called the borderline switch from different parts of themselves. Um, so uh, it's not that straightforward. But what I would look for somebody who's borderline is somebody that um, may move very quickly between devaluing a person and uh, ad admiring a person. Okay. In other words, somebody who might idealise uh, people, but also attack them. So and would that be relevant to the therapist as well, that they would switch with the therapist in a session? Oh, inevitably. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's just taken as read. It's what the therapist does about that. Um, now, in the assessment, they struggle, they're struggling, of course, not to move to a devaluing place, but it'll often come out that switch they move from anger to passivity uh, in the assessment situation. So I'd look for that. Secondly, people who have that type of emotional process will have great difficulties in holding interpersonal relationships and stroke intimacy. So they will report having difficulties um, maintaining long-term relationships and having challenges around intimacy. Okay. That's another thing I would look for. On uh, all levels, sort of within the family, within relationships, within a working environment. Someone who's got a, uh, a, a, a even if they're a high functional borderline, the answer is yes to your question. They're better off actually in the work um, because they can have some element of control therefore they're more able to stay in their adult ego state but in personal relationships and life they struggle okay so those are some of them um, if you were to look at the dsm4 diagnostic category for the features of a borderline personality disorder and again remember i'm going to talk about it disordered but also the trait level yeah um, i've got here one of them um, the first one is a fear of morbid uh, morbid abandonment. In other words, 
they have a great fear of being left. So yeah. in the in the um, assessment, if you took a assessment of their history and their profile, and you talk to them about relationships, um, what would probably come out is they need their neediness and their fear of an abandonment. In other words, a fear of being left. So what they do, of course, is move to a place of over neediness in terms of compensation. Yeah. But they will have a great fear of abandonment, which um, will, uh, of course, go back to their early childhood, but is a very um, familiar trait in the therapy. It will come up time and time again that they fear people will leave them. And therefore, they move usually to uh, a place of learned helplessness so the person doesn't leave them. Yes, yeah. Which I think can can show up in a therapy room, regardless of a diagnosis or or whether somebody's, you know, borderline. Sometimes the client can appear to be helpless in the therapy room, looking for the therapist to fix them or to make it better or to do something. Yeah, yeah. Now, when people come to therapy, they usually come with what I call a Father Christmas experience. Yeah. And then they're looking for the therapist. It doesn't have to have a beard, but a therapist who will actually be there, their, their, their sort of Father Christmas to take care of them and do it all for them and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And certainly, we were talking about passive aggressive in another podcast. And of course, that that's, that's often where passive aggressive profile will come from, that they have learned helplessness. And, um, you know, they, they go from a pa- passive position in hope that the Prince Charming will come along and work it out for them. Yeah. So the borderline does that, but they don't do that wholly. In other words, they, they will move very, very quickly from this passive, idealising, helpless place to a devaluing, attacking part of themselves which has a fury at being um, childlike. At themselves or project that out? Well, at themselves, but they, of course, will project that onto the therapist, but it's primarily at themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest trap, we'll talk about this probably in the next podcast. I know they'll cross over this slightly, but the, the biggest, biggest trap for somebody for a therapist or people in relationships, basically with people who've got these early confusion issues is by um, attempting to help or support the helplessness uh, position of the, the client. Yeah. That is mean big, that, that we buy into that helplessness. Yeah, that we are somehow, um, attempt to cure what or what wasn't curable all those years ago yeah and if we buy into that we are trapped and reenacting that early drama of childhood that they are playing out or enacting with the therapist about what the therapist needs to do and we'll talk about again in this next podcast is confront the helplessness position yeah. the borderline moves into which then I would imagine touches on the rage part if you're not yeah. playing the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so one of the, in the diagnostic features that we just talked about of the DSM-5, I think it's a second or third feature, they talk about the feature of the borderline client or the unstable client who will move very quickly from admiration, idealization of the therapist, and they'll do this in personal relationships, to devaluing and attacking the therapist. Now yeah. that's very quick. See, yeah. with, a, with a bipolar, that, that won't happen quickly. That's gonna much, much uh, longer. And they don't attack so much, actually. They go into a mania position, the, uh, the, pass, you know, um, the bipolar position and the depressive position. Whereas with the borderline position, it's much more around a helpless idolization, admiration, move into attacking and devaluating and and, and and what is called the borderline rage 
and very and very intimidating intimidating and could be very frightening for the therapist not experienced that yet so far bob oh right well if you do i've had him being a bit miffed with me but i wouldn't say i've had the full-on rage well it depends how disordered or or, or lack of function they are but if you if you do ever experience a full blown up psychotic rage uh, it's very can be very frightening and intimidating for the therapist and especially the younger therapists yeah i can then, imagine yeah then you know what to do yeah so that also gets played out in life so they will report when they come from therapy often uh difficulties lack of stability continuity and maintenance of personal relationships they are unable to do it in other words what they will talk about is uh, uh, how they move backwards and forwards from rage to helplessness or they or wanted to attack the the the, 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 um, the other person yeah which you get you know as a parent I would imagine we can relate that to how it is with a young child that it's very black and white again it's kind of opposite sides to the same coin that admiration devaluing it's you know my dad used to say things like there's a very fine line between love and hate and it's kind of like the same thing to flip from one to the other mm. well yes but however borderline will do this very intensely it yeah. could be life and death for them yeah so the you know the temperature in the therapy room will be very high. Hot under the collar, as you said. Yeah, it will be a Leonard Cohen type uh, process. And what I mean by that, it will be very intense and it'll be about life and death. Yeah. And it will feel that way. There won't be any lightness. So therapy sessions with people who present this way, um, are not a therapy session that will be light in any way. Yeah, which, you know, is, is the reason why a lot of us have supervision. <laughs> because if, if you're having, because there's kind of, I'm not sure whether I'm right or wrong now, there's an 80-20 rule with, with the clients that you take on. Is that still a thing? you know that if you were to take on a, a borderline or narcissistic client that you need to limit the amount in a week well i certainly think if you're going to take on highly disturbed clients who can uh, at the drop of a hat and move to a psychotic position or, or or the ways that we're just talking about you wouldn't have many of them no because they'd be very draining yeah and, you know, they're going to move very quickly from idolising you to attacking you. Yeah. And when they move to wanting to annihilate you and devaluate you, then it's like, how do you keep your professional persona on? And it, it's not that straightforward. No, no. And I suppose, you know, go, going off the, the path a little bit, in, in the day and age we are in now with social media and online things, you know, if, if they're trying to take us out that potentially is is quite detrimental to us in our business oh. so the, if we talk i think it's useful just talking about the borderline dilemma here i know i'll repeat it in the next podcast but i think i need to because if we're talking about features of a borderline without talking about the borderline dilemma um we have a bit more problems so even though I repeat it again in another podcast, I'm going to say it here. Yeah, yeah. So you're completely correct. Um, you need to think in terms of um, early developmental milestones, and early de developmental trauma that gets enacted out uh, in the therapy room and in life. Yeah. When you're looking with this type of person. So the dilemma, early, early dilemma for the person uh, that we're talking about here happens very early in life between one and a half and three and one and a half and three in child developmental terms is often called the separation identification time or rapprochement period 
when obviously, inevitably, the child has to grow up and the toddler strikes out, if you like, in terms of uh, freedom yeah. and um, individual, being an individual, individuating. Um, they have to be an individual and grow up and they strike out. Now, in normal, healthy process, the parent understands that isn't so mortally wounded and allows them to test their own autonomy in a safe way, of course, in terms of boundaries being put yeah, in, yeah. everything that goes with that. And they allow themselves, so allow the child to, you know, in inverted commas, grow up in a safe way, which is very, very important psychologically, uh, of course, for the toddler to grow up. But you imagine a situation where the, ch the child growing up, you know, in that helpless place where all their needs are being met and as they start to grow and get into one, one year and they start to walk and et cetera, et cetera, and they start testing their own power and they make that leap for freedom, if you want to put it that way, in a, in a safe boundary situation. And then the mother feels so hurt um, and what they perceive as abandonment of the toddler growing up, that they withdraw all love and punish the child for individuating and attempting to grow up. Yeah. So, so the child then feels abandoned, worthless, devalued, hopeless, and the only way they can get any affection and strokes is to start being helpless and being very young again and infantilized. And then the mother feels uh, that their needs are being met in that sort of way we're talking about and starts to give the child strokes and, and recognition. And that's the dilemma. The dilemma is that the child isn't able to grow up psychologically without stepping backwards and being a child to comfort and need the uh, mother. Now, if you think about that and transport it to uh, their attempt to stabilize relationships and have intimacy, they're not able to do it because every time they, they start to, to take care of the other person or to maintain their own personal relationships or to grow up or to be an individual, they feel that they can't do that. They have to be taking care of the mother and being helpless, regressed and needy. So they are able to grow up. Yeah. That's the dilemma that gets enacted out time and time and time for the uh, people around them as they grow up. One of the things that, you know, sometimes I get asked questions about when you're talking about an early childhood trauma, is that That's how the... Dramatic, isn't it? Where you can't grow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's kind of like through the child's eyes, a trauma. Well, if you being, if you suddenly you attempt to, uh, you know, take a step upstairs or you attempt to sort of really um, make some powerful uh, step for autonomy or take risks but you get a mother that gets furious at that he may or may not hit them may verbally shout at them and saying your job is to take care of me not to actually um, act out or be powerful or whatever language you want to yeah, use yeah yeah um, you have to take care of me and then everything will be all right in life. Yeah. That's pretty traumatic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I'm just, you know, people people that are listening to this, their, their understanding of what that trauma might be, you know, that, that feeling of abandonment and things, it's not necessarily that a, a parent has passed away or been in a major accident or no, that sort no. of trauma okay, let's it's, put it's the emotional yeah. psychological okay. trauma yeah okay. so my daughter's 22 she got married last week 
I did the father of my speech and I was talking about when I met my daughter when she first came into the world at 22 and she captured my heart and here we are 22 years later but you imagine if I never allowed her to be an individual yeah she would never have been able to function in the world in yeah. a healthy way because she'd always be taking care of me being dependent on me being regressed being she'd just be always be a child wouldn't she yeah 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 but I think it's important to point that out because sometimes when we talk about trauma you know people's filter or people's idea of what that trauma is you know kind of is from naught to ten on the sliding scale of traumatic events mm. but if, uh, from the child's point of view that is traumatic to never be able to be an individual no. to never be able to prioritize <laughs> themselves and what they want to do without being connected to the parents yeah. in some way yeah and taking care of the yeah you know uh, in, in a way that you you have when I'm saying take care of them I mean stay little stay yeah. passive not thinking for themselves yeah which is that learnt helplessness where you can't think for yourself it, it yeah. shuts down yeah yeah so the the mother's thinking is all important yeah yeah and it's debilitating yeah. it is it's yeah they end up stuck they're completely stuck. Yeah. They, they can't think for themselves because it's dangerous, because they might um, affront the parent. The parent has to take the thinking. The parent has to have the monopoly of truth. Uh, the parent is the one that is in charge of their emotional life. And the only way they can get any care or loving is to uh, play this learned helpless child. Yeah. Which, which gets the strokes and validation from the parent. Mm, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because that's what it's all about a lot of the time, is, is the validation and the recognition and the strokes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so that when the child attempts to think for themselves, back here that we talked about in this early years, attempts to have feelings, the mother withdraws love, withdraws care, yeah. So the child then feels abandoned and goes into terror. Yeah. That the mother isn't around. Yeah. And that that terror that you say, it's it is terror. It's a survival thing. It's life and death stuff, mm. like you were saying earlier on. It's it's not it would be nice to have this. It is it's life and death. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you can see with totally young toddlers. If the mother walks out of the door, yeah, yeah, in the moment they get ter they may yeah. get terrified. Yeah. Now with the borderline that we're talking about here, the mother stays out outside the room until the child becomes more and more and more helpless and more and more passive and more terrified, and then they come back in again and strokes them. Yeah. So they get stroked. They get recognised for being little. Yeah. They get recognised for not thinking. They get recognised for being the slave to the mother. Yeah. Now the question is, how can you have a mature relationship from that position if you're always enacting that out? If you're always expecting the, the other person to do the thinking for them, to uh, do the feeling for them, to do to do all these things and when of course the person can't do it because they're not their mother and they wouldn't want to do it anyway then the person uh, gets terrified of the enactment of that abandonment and goes into a rage or becomes even more helpless yeah yeah and I, you know one of the things i i would like to think that the listeners get from this you know it, it, not necessarily psychotherapists or coaches or anything but just you know the lay person is it a kind of understanding as to where this stuff all starts 
This is where it's Yeah, when we talk about borderline and narcissistic and all these things, often we see the end result of it as, as an adult and being in a relationship with somebody that's displaying these disorders or traits. But when we see how and where it starts, hopefully it puts the more compassionate view on things. I know it's not nice if you're on the receiving end of it, but again, it's not that they're deliberately doing this to hurt the other person. No, they're continue playing this drama out. Yeah. Other people in an attempt to one, get a different outcome. Yeah. And secondly, to have a sense of continuity and their own identity and how they see themselves and other people in the world. Yeah. But of course, it can never work because if they're always, you know, playing out this dramatic situation, always projecting onto another person, then they're never going to have a healthy adult functioning relationship. They're going to be living in the terror of abandonment mm -hmm. or stroke or stroke being helpless and needy as a, in an attempt to keep the other one in the relationship. Yeah. So the, the relationship is going to be very toxic. It's going to be very emotive. It's going to be very exhausting. Yeah, because if you're in a relationship and someone is very uh, over needy, very helpless, very young, it doesn't um, think things through, but all of them as an attempt to keep you in the relationship. Yeah. And then they then at a moment, if you like, or may seem like a very quick process, the the person moves to. Um, being very angry and devaluing, then you've got a very unstable relationship. Now, the per why the person has done that, by the way, is that they um, fear the person in the relationship going, just like their mother did when they withdraw for having feelings and being individual. Yeah. But of course, if you're gonna, if you think about the other side of being in relationships, it's like you're having a relationship with a child or a child that's very uh, helpless one moment and then very angry the next moment. Yeah. So they're both the vain attempts by the client to keep the other in relationship, but actually does the opposite. I was just going to say, but ultimately it plays out the same way because to be in that relationship is going to be very difficult to stick around. So the abandonment that they're doing everything to prevent is is quite possible. So they will do that with the therapist. Yeah. They will idolize a the therapist. They'll go to a place of being helpless. They'll go to a place of not thinking because that's how it was and that's how they got the love of the mother. But at the same time, they'll be really frightened that the therapist will withdraw the taking care the thinking and all those things and any sniff of that they all then move to attacking or they escalate the helplessness yeah now if you take that to its logical conclusion just take it to logical inclusion then if they're not getting what they want from the therapist which is impossible mm -hmm. because um you know the therapist is not their mother or their father and also can't repair history, right? So it's impossible. There's nothing they can do. Nothing would be enough, right? Then what will happen is that the client will either escalate even more helplessness and attempt to get what is impossible, or they'll rage. So what do you think the worst thing a therapist could do in that situation? What, when somebody is in a rage? When somebody is either acting out, helpless, passive, uh, increased helplessness, not thinking, appearing like a three-year-old, yeah, that's one level. Uh, and then they may experience them also getting very angry and raging because anything that the therapist does appears like abandonment. So what the worst, the worst thing I was going to say to you is is when the therapist 
doesn't set boundaries. Yeah. Buys into that helplessness and goes to from a place, what can I do to help? Mm. But there's nothing they can do to help because it no. isn't going to cause in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, the boundaries, I think, is is really important. Because once you buy into that, once you're embroiled in that, if you try to step out of that, then that's seen as abandonment by them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. always fearing abandonment. Yeah. So, so the borderline is really, really, really stuck because when they attempt to have any individual thinking themselves, any individual feeling themselves, having any sense of power, they fear the therapist abandoning them. Yeah. So they'll do one or two things. They'll increase their aggressive childlike behavior or they'll move to attacking. Both ways they see as an attempt to keep the therapist in the relationship. But of course, what it does is it pushes away the therapist. And the same process I'm explaining here, they do in relationships, which is why relationships fail. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's very difficult or it must be very difficult to be, you know, in, in that relationship because it's kind of like a game of chess and whatever you do, they're going to perceive that as, as an abandonment issue. You know, if somebody's coming at you, you know, really full of rage and everything it, and, and you respond in a neutral manner and not kind of react and respond to that is that seen as an abandonment? Is that seen as you not being connected with them and how they perceive that behaviour? Yeah. So it's quarter to 10 at night. You just watch your favourite TV programme and you get uh, your favourite tipple, which would be Grand Bowie whiskey with me. <laughs> sitting down and the phone goes. Yeah. You pick up the phone and it's a client from this perspective we're talking about saying, can I just have a couple of minutes to talk to you? Something awful has happened. Two minutes turns into 10 minutes. 10 minutes turns into 20 minutes. 20 minutes turns into half an hour. How does a therapist ever go off the phone? Now, with that type of client, almost impossible. Yeah. Because that's just extreme. They can say, you, you are just like all the others. You're leaving me. I might as well kill myself. In fact, I'll go and do it now. Yeah. So, Bob, we, we, if we're going to start talking about some situations and how we handle this and, and the treatment of this, we need to end this podcast and move into the next one. OK. I yeah. hope you've got a good picture of the features of how somebody with this profile would present. So the next podcast, yeah, is more about what we do about it. Yeah. So it's all about the ideation and the devaluing. It's it's that. Yeah, it's what, what helplessness and the rage. Yeah, it's what we do next. Yeah. Okay, okay. So we'll be back soon for the next instalment, part two of working with the borderline client. Okay. Good. See you soon. Bye bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.